So we turn to Philippians chapter 2 and one of the clearest statements that Paul gives us in the whole of his writings and it's Paul's epistles that make up the bulk of the New Testament out with the Gospels. One of the clearest statements of Paul about Christ, his person and his work. And it comes in that passage that we read earlier on that's set in sort of uh, in different format on the page, set almost as poetry. Paul may have been quoting a hymn from verse 6 to verse 11 of our passage. He may have been quoting a hymn that was current in the early church. It may have been Paul himself who wrote it, although it's not common for Paul to spring into spontaneous poetry uh, throughout his writing. But either way, this expresses for Paul exactly what he wanted to say about Christ. And before we look at the impact that that was to have on the congregation in Philippi, we need for a few moments to pause and let what Paul is saying here soak into our minds about Christ, about his descent and his exaltation. From verse 6 through to verse 8, we have something of the downward progression of Christ is in, in his humility. Paul starts off, as we were thinking with the children, high up. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, that is, who is equal with God. Christ, who is one with the Father and the Spirit. One with them in glory and honor. One with them in might and wisdom. Christ Jesus, who wasn't just a good man. One of the greatest failings of the church is that it has allowed Christ to be presented as merely a good man. And if we believe that Christ was just a good man and a good example, then we have missed the point. He isn't just a good man. In fact, as C.S. Lewis says at one point in his book, Mere Christianity, if Christ is to be merely a good man, then he isn't actually that. A good man does not claim to be God. A good man does not claim to be the Messiah. A good man does not claim to be the criterion by which God the Father will judge men and women. If all we think of Christ is that he is a good man, then he wasn't a good man. And as C.S. Lewis goes on to say, he's to be taken as seriously as a man who claims to be a poached egg. He is God. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. That is something to be clutched at, something to be retained, something to be held on to at all cost, something to be pulled to himself and never ever let go of. But made himself nothing. Took upon himself the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see how Paul is, as it were, seeing Christ leaving the very heights of glory and coming down to this earth, this sin-sick, sin-ridden earth as a man finite, prone to tiredness, hunger, pain, prone to all the rejection of other men and women, prone to misunderstanding and misrepresentation, prone to grief, became a man. Not just a man but a servant. And the word that Paul uses there is the Greek word doulos. It means a slave. 
somebody who has no rights, no freedom, somebody who has forfeited all claim to honor, prestige, whatever. Think of it for a moment. Think of the one who had angels and archangels worshipping and glorifying him. The one who by the very word of his command brought all things into being. The one who made heaven and earth, who made these other men and women. He became a man, he became a servant, a slave. And who as a servant, as a slave was obedient. Obedient primarily to his father, to his father's will. And became obedient even to death even when it cost him his life and not just any death but as Paul says even death on a cross yes a death of great shame of horrific cruelty we have turned the cross into something merely symbolic we have turned the cross into a work of art we have prettified and domesticated the cross we wear it, we put it on the fronts of our Bibles, we decorate our churches with it. But the cross was not pretty. The cross was no work of art. And the cross was no mere symbol. It was horrific. It was awful. But it was also a death with a very particular theological significance because as the word of God says cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree it was on the cross with all its shame with all its public disgrace with all its agony with all its violence that Christ bore the curse that your sin and my sin brings. And you see how low he went? Broken. Utterly and completely broken. Not just a man who was broken, and that's an awful enough sight, if ever you've seen it. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every way, wrecked. But this was God on the cross. Broken. Ruined. Dead. But not left there. Because as Paul goes on to say in verses 9 to 11, the Christ who had humbled himself in that way was exalted by his Father. Therefore God the Father, that is, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Blasphemers beware if you are in the habit of using God's name in vain. You are using the name that is above every name. If Jesus is a casual name upon your lips, take care because God sees that name differently from you that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow every knee friend, foe keen, zealous for Christ totally apathetic every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and all of it, all of it, to the glory of God the Father. Now that is the attitude 
that Paul wants these Philippian believers to have. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Why? Why does Paul paint with such vivid colors Christ's own humility and the way in which before everything else he sought his Father's glory? Why does he do it? Because Paul is writing to a congregation that was divided. Paul is writing to a church made up of some young Christians, some who have been in the faith many years. Paul is writing to a people who are grouped together from different social backgrounds. Lydia, the first convert in Philippi, a wealthy businesswoman. There are slaves. There are Asians, there are Romans, there are Greeks. They're a real mixture. He's writing to people who would be con very keen to go out and witness in Philippi. He's writing to those who might be more like passengers in the congregation. He's writing to those who think they really are something. He's writing to those who think they're nothing. He's writing to a congregation which is divided. And he says to them, be like Christ. Why? Because the answer for a divided congregation was not that they should all start to think exactly the same thing. Not that they should all start to say the same things and do the same things. Paul wanted unity in the congregation in Philippi, not uniformity. Let me illustrate the difference. You can put 11 men in the same strip on a Saturday afternoon on a football park, or at least 10 men and a goalkeeper in the same strip. Same shirt, same shorts, socks, same boots. But unless they're actually playing together as a team, you'll have uniformity. They'll all have the uniform on. They'll all look the same, but you won't have unity. In actual fact, you can have the unity despite the uniform. You can have 11 people with very diverse abilities and talents and gifts playing different positions on a park, fulfilling different roles within the team, being very different. 11 diverse characters, but working together. Paul wanted not uniformity, not clones of himself or of somebody else in the congregation, but he did want unity. And he wanted unity among this congregation because their unity was going to express something about God. It wasn't going to be achieved by them all thinking the same thing, or doing the same thing, or speaking the same things, or even wearing the same things. It was going to be achieved by them holding their differences together in what? In humility and in love. Humility because Christ was humble before his Father. Because Christ sought his Father's honor before anything else, even his own life. And so Paul wrote to these Philippians, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do you want a better example than Christ? But in humility consider others better than yourselves. Humility. And then seeking the honor of God. And seeking the honor of those around us. Each of you, he writes in verse 4, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now that is the answer to a divided congregation. Not that everyone be the same, but that a congregation holds together its differences in humility and in love. And together, with one mind, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. 
having the mind of Christ. Just before we make one particular application of that to our own congregation, there is something about that word mind, which is the word that's used to translate the word attitude uh, in the authorized version that some of you may be more familiar with. Uh, in the authorized version, verse 5 reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's something about that word mind which we ought to take notice of. It doesn't just mean attitude, as the New International Version translators have put. It has something more to it than that. The word mind has the idea of attitude, but also of purpose. We have the same kind of phrase in English. We say that somebody had a mind to do something. It means that they were fairly determined. They had decided. They had made up their mind. They had a purpose to do it. They had a mind to go to the match that afternoon. They had a mind to pick an argument. They had a mind to do something kind and generous. They had a mind to do it. And that's wrapped up in the Greek word, nous, for mind. Purpose. What Paul is saying is not just your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. He's saying to these Philippians, listen, you've got to make up your mind to be like this. You've got to make up your mind that your life is going to go in the same direction that Christ's has gone down before it will ever go up. You've got to decide for this. It won't happen by accident. It won't happen by you sitting back in, in an armchair and it's so, suddenly swamping you. You've got to decide for this. This has to be a purpose. Your mind deliberately should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We're sometimes tempted to think that if we just kind of sit back in the Christian life, if we just sit back in a pew, if we just sit back in our chairs at home, if we just sit back, then somehow or another, magically and mysteriously, we will grow more like Christ. Somehow or another, our church, magically and mysteriously, will grow in depth and in numbers. But Paul was saying to these Philippians, it doesn't happen like that. Your mind, your purpose, as well as your attitude, your decisive will for the future has to be the same as Christ. You have to make up your mind and stick to it. Now how are we going to apply what Paul was writing to this divided congregation to ourselves? Well, in the first place, it means that not one of us can think that we are superior to anybody else. If any of us, and I mean minister as well as congregation, if any of us thinks that we are better than anybody else who's here this morning, then we are wrong. And the mere fact that we are thinking it proves the matter. We're wrong. That's not a Christian attitude. Even if we are sitting here this morning thinking, that's just for somebody else over there. Yes, they could do to be listening to that. Then we're wrong. It's for me. And for you. There's another way that we can apply this though. And it addresses a problem which perhaps we face as a congregation which is particular to us at the moment, and it's this. And I want to make a comment which has been kind of brewing for a while, but which is very relevant and is directed by the passage today. And it's this. There are those in the congregation who have been here for three years or less, and there are those who have been in the congregation, I was going to say for 103 years or less. 73 years or less. There are those who are keen, who are involved, and there are those who aren't. There are those who are 
visibly doing things. There are those who do things behind the scenes. And there are those who do nothing. But perhaps the greatest risk of division within the congregation of Logie and St. John's Cross is that division between those who are new and those who have been here for many years. Now that's a real division, a real possibility. Some in the congregation are sensitive to that, some are not. But it is a very real possibility. It has happened in other congregations that those who have started to come around a church have not mixed with those who have been there many years and vice versa. Now there are many reasons for that. But what Paul is saying here goes some way to helping us in our congregation avoid that danger. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We can get round the problem by speaking to one another. But that's not always easy. It doesn't come easily to everybody to walk up to strangers and introduce themselves. But we can do more of that. We can avoid the danger by regarding anybody, anybody who worships in our congregation, whether they've been worshipping for a day or for half a century, as belonging here, and as this and of this church as being theirs just as much as it is ours. But you know we can go one step further. We can ask God to give to each of us a love which does not come from ourselves. A love for the people sitting next to us and behind us and in front of us. People that we may never have spoken to. People whose names we do not know. We can ask God to give us a love for one another and a respect for one another. And we can ask God to give to each of us, never mind anybody else, but to each of us, the attitude that Christ showed. Complete, complete humility before God and before man. And then let God the Father do the exalting. The way for an individual and the way for a congregation is shown to us in these verses and it's really very simple. It's something that Christ spoke about when he spoke about not choosing the highest place at a meal, at a table, but rather choosing the lowest place. It's something that the Bible speaks about when it talks about the first shall be last and the last shall be first. It's something that one minister summed up in the phrase, the way up is down. For an individual and for the congregation of Logan St. John's Cross, minister and people, the way up, the way of blessing, the way of honouring by God, the way ahead, is the way down of humility and service and self-giving. Amen.